Thank you so much for joining us today for our program, which is titled Key Steps for Achieving Successful Civil Justice Reform. We have with us today myself, Brittany Kaufman, Brooke Meyer, and David Slayton. I'm going to start by doing a brief introduction of each of us and then launch into our program. I am from IELTS, the Institute for the Advancement of the American Legal System, and we are a research center at the University of Denver. We are focused on research and improving the American legal system, and we work across a number of areas, including civil justice reform, family justice reform, legal education, legal profession, and the judiciary. And we have existed now for 15 years, and we are excited to be talking with you today about civil justice reform in particular. Myself, I'm a senior director here at IELTS. I've been with IELTS for eight years and focused in particular on the work of civil justice reform. In my title now, I oversee all of our programmatic work and uh, have been working on the topic that we are, are addressing here today, civil justice reform in our state courts over the last uh, six years or so on this particular project that we'll be talking about. So I'm very excited to share with you how far we have come over the last six years. I also have with me today Brooke Meyer. She's a manager at IELTS and she works with me on the civil justice reform efforts. And she has in particular uh, worked with me and we have worked together and collaborated on the roadmap project, which we're gonna be speaking about in particular today. Uh, so we bring that background as a team on this effort. And finally today we have David Slayton. He is the Administrative Director of the Texas Office of Court Administration. And I will say for this audience, he needs no introduction, but I'll uh, share a little bit. He is a past president of NACOM, and in his position as Administrative Director, he also serves as the Executive Director of the Texas Judicial Council. And he has served in his role as administrative director for the last or since 2012. So we are excited to have him here today and have his expertise on this panel. And we have worked with him on this project, Brooke and I. And so we're excited to talk about our efforts and lessons learned and to share with you all key steps for achieving uh, successful civil justice reform and not just with uh, not just generally, but in this moment of the pandemic and the challenges that I know courts are facing around our country. So with that, I'm gonna start us off by providing a little background about this project. This project in particular goes back to 2013 and of course many efforts on civil justice reform prior to that. But in 2013, the Conference of Chief Justices adopted a resolution that created the Civil Justice Improvements Committee. And in adopting that resolution, the Conference of Chief Justices called upon that committee to pull together the best practices and lessons learned from a number of civil justice reform efforts that were happening around the country at that time. And those were happening in pilot projects, statewide rule reforms, and other efforts. And the goal of creating that committee was to create a, a very diverse uh, committee with a, a great deal of background and expertise from across all of those states that had been innovative in this area and to learn from those experiences as well as the evaluations that had been done at that time on behalf of those states and to develop clear guidance for the rest of the country. The goal was really to create a set of recommendations and best practices for the rest of the United States so that states around the country could pick up those recommendations and implement reforms on a national basis. And those included guidance on rule reforms as well as best practices on case management. And I will also note that those recommendations were really focused on the challenges facing state courts at that time. And that included limited funding, limited access, declining civil caseloads, changing landscapes, and a real clear increase in the number of self-represented litigants. That committee was comprised of approximately 25 members of chief justices, state court, uh, um, judges, trial judges, court administrators, uh, members of national organizations, um, 
business, people with business backgrounds, general counsel, uh, a really wide variety of stakeholders that provided in, input and expertise towards that ultimate product, which you see here, which is a set of recommendations to key publications that came out in 2016. And those recommendations really provided um, key guidance and hopefully some inspiration to transform our state courts for uh, the needs of the 20th, uh, 21st century. And I wanted to highlight just a few of those recommendations because I think uh, they're really important in this moment and go to key reforms and civil justice uh, reform efforts. So the first recommendation is that courts must take responsibility for managing civil cases from the time of filing to disposition. And that is really the bedrock principle of these recommendations, the recognition that it is not up to the lawyers to be moving cases through our system. We really, as a court system, need to recognize the responsibility that we have to manage our dockets, manage those cases, and be responsive to those challenges that I just faced. And that's particularly true given the research that went into this report, the landscape that was done by the National Center for State Courts, and the recognition that in 76% of cases nationally, on one side or the other, there's a self-represented litigant. And so in this moment with the dockets and the challenges we face as a court system, the recommendation really was that courts have to recognize this responsibility and take ownership of those cases. And I think that is all the more critical as we face this pandemic and we're facing the challenges in this moment and courts are really taking up that responsibility and ensuring that we're providing justice as a system. So I wanted to highlight that. I think that's really relevant in this moment and we can talk further about that when we talk as a panel. The other thing I wanted to recognize is that the Recommendations really called out the need for this responsibility to lie with the courts. And when we talked about courts, we talked about courts as not just the judges, but the entire court system, the whole judicial branch that includes the court managers, court staff, that it's really a team effort and that that's critical in modernizing our courts to work together as a whole. Uh, and I think particularly relevant for this audience and in this time. That uh, I won't go through any of the other recommendations except for just, just highlight, we really took a broad vision of our court system and talked about both responsibility, as I have said, but also triaging, right sizing for the cases, court personnel, court resources, how to use technology wisely, focusing attention on those high volume cases, which are such a large part of our docket, and then focusing on providing superior access and, for litigants of all types. So that kind of is a highlight of those recommendations. I strongly encourage you to take a look at those if you have not. And from there, I'll just highlight a quote that came from our, the chair of that committee. Um, and, and I didn't mention it earlier, but that's a committee that IELTS and the National Center for State Courts work together to support and staff. And um, I was privileged to work on that effort over the course of those years. Uh, I worked with uh, at the time, Chief Justice Thomas Balmer of the Oregon Supreme Court, who was our chair, and he shared this quote at the time of the release of the report, that change is coming, and you can be ahead of the curve or behind it, and if we make the changes ourselves as a judicial system, we have more control over those outcomes. I think, again, that it's a really helpful quote in this moment, as we're talking about the pandemic and the court's response. All right. And with that, I just wanted to share this visual. This is my visual for kind of where these recommendations get us. So they definitely don't get us all the way there. This is a huge effort, but it got us about halfway there because we recognize that the next step is really for the courts uh, on a state level basis to pick up these recommendations and to, to review them and to uh, put them in place in their particular state. And as we developed these recommendations, we really recognized that we had to take a high level approach and provide recommendations that were workable across the system, but also knowing that states would come to these recommendations with their own set of backgrounds, staffing, funding, technology, and history of reform. And so that every state would really have to pick up the recommendations and take them that last uh, step of the way into actual implementation.
And so that was our next step as a effort with the National Center for State Courts and Isles was to say, how do we provide the support to the states that they need to take these recommendations and actually put them into place? And so we launched into a three year implementation effort and that was from 2017 to 2019. And that effort included many aspects of um, evaluation, pilot projects, technical assistance, uh, partnerships, education, webinars, uh, civil justice reform summits that happened in regions around the country and more. And one of the first things we did was this publication called A Roadmap for Implementation. And what we wanted to do was provide a clear set of steps for state courts to pick these recommendations up and put them in place on, uh, at that state level. And so we created these steps. Uh, we put a lot of thought into this process and what that would look like in terms of what are best practices that we learned as a national committee. It really reflected uh, the steps that we had gone through uh, from start to finish for two to three years as a committee. And also we pulled from the experiences of all of those pilots around the country and other reform efforts. And here I'll just highlight a few things on this slide. Um, we just recognized that courts needed that support to take them from a report to actual action. And we wanted to give a strategy for how to get there uh, for the court system so that these recommendations would not just be set, uh, put on a shelf. We wanted to really give the how-to. And then from there, uh, what we did was we launched a whole effort to identify four states that would be our what we call roadmap states that we would partner with so that we wouldn't just provide the guidance, but that we could look and learn from the efforts of four states. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brooke to talk a little bit more about those experiences and partnering with those four states and the case study that we conducted alongside those states to uh, learn from the state experiences. Thank you, Brittany. Um, so what we did was Brittany and I visited each individual state and what we did is we conducted interviews of um, most if not all committee members from each of the states, Idaho, Maine, Missouri, Texas, to see really what they did with their civil justice reform efforts. Um, the committee members were comprised of um, initial leaders, um, chairs of uh, the chairs of the committee members, um, judges, attorneys in private practice, legal aid attorneys, court administrators, including technology liaisons, um, and other stakeholders important to the process. We asked the same set of questions to each person interviewed. So we had a standard form of what we were uh, gauging so that we could gauge the process and see what each state went through. Um, and each state was different. And so um, the important questions um, came from um, each state as, um, if, if you could go to a slide, Nine, please, Brittany. Um, so we asked them um, questions about the process. Um, how did the initial um, task force um, initiate within the courts? Was it from the bar? Was it from the Supreme Court? Was there a written charge? Um, and what was the initial scope of the project? Uh, we asked whether or not um, states conducted their own landscape assessment and whether or not the uh, provided um, DIY landscape was helpful. Um, some of the states said um, that their landscape assessment and most of them were deficient in some way and they had problems um, finding their own data. So they supplemented data with um, the National Center for State Courts data or they look to other states. And we also asked how the committee members defined issues, who was involved in the process of defining issues, and what was the process used to come to agreement on the problems to be solved. Um, and so 
a lot of the committee members would define a certain scope and not touch other issues um, outside of the scope of that charge. And also, we look to creating a working group and engaging stakeholders. How many people were involved in the working group? For example, Missouri had a very large working group um, over a very large geographic scope. And what we found when we interviewed them was that they actually thought that the 25 to 30 committee members was a very small committee compared to what other states or what they have done with other task force forces. Um, other states had um, a smaller task force or committee members, but that suited them best for their efforts. Um, we also asked whether or not there were legislators on the committee um, or whether they got legislative input. And um, we found that most states did. Um, and when the legislative efforts were not used or were not reviewed or someone from the legislature was not um, looped in, then um, sometimes legis the legislature took uh, matters into their own hands and produced um, their own version or um, thought they worked with what they what they did best um, on their side of um, the the, their branch of government. Um, we also asked whether or not um, the committee received input from the legal community in general, and and how did they do that? And um, the one of the things that Brittany said first is is that the the court must take um, ownership of cases, and there was pushback. Um, when the bar and attorneys were consulted. And uh, I think that's a natural first instinct for attorneys to say that, that we own the case and it's our case. But um, when you receive that pushback, you just have to dig deeper and say, uh, we're all in this and, and we're working at it from a court flow perspective. And the attorneys may, um, consult with your clients and push the case forward, but the court system is really going to um, take charge of this case um, overall for the good of the entire judicial system. So um, the attorneys um, in some jurisdictions did push back on that. We also have, um, we asked whether or not the committee members in the task force uh, we visited their vision and goals. And I think one of the most important questions is how do you deviate at any point? And Idaho is a is actually a good example of following the roadmap. Um, and Texas is another good example of following the roadmap. And um, it just depends on the jurisdiction of where they're coming in. I know that each of the four states came in the process of civil justice reform at a different point. Um, in so Texas was one of is a state that's pretty progressive with their reforms for for judicial reform. And um, Maine was another one that uh, another state that we visited where they did deviate from the roadmap a bit, but when they got back on and consulted um, with additional stakeholders, and um, asked attorneys what their opinions were. Um, the process worked um, and identified additional people to, to put on the, co the committee. Um, Main got the attorney's input and additional judges' input. And um, it, the goals did change from their committee. Um, and then from there, um, once they gathered the vision and the goals, the the important thing was to develop recommendations tailored to the very specific jurisdiction. And Brittany and I asked what the process was for developing recommendations that were you know, appropriate for each state and their unique aspects to each jurisdiction. For example, um, Maine has a unique um, a court system set up where they have um, 
jurisdiction over um, the two courts have the same jurisdiction over cases. And so attorneys are able to file in each one of those um, courts. It just depends on which court they file in. And um, while there was a tiering system that was initially proposed by the committee, the um, it, it just wasn't possible for each court for each case to be tiered and differentiated into a specific uh, court because each court had um, jurisdiction over that. There were two types of trial courts, and that would involve going to the legislature and changing, I think, 1,200 different laws. So at that point, they just had to um, main sought out um, looking at. Um, a different way to get to those recommendations. And, and they determined that um, changing the rules uh, was appropriate for them and the rules of civil process um, as much as they could within the defined laws. Um, and so the, the important thing here uh, is taking action, of course. That's um, what, the, what the crux of the purpose of the roadmap is, is to take action and to do pilot projects. Um, and a lot of the states that we interviewed, most of the states, except for I think it was Texas, um, had not taken action at that point. And um, I, I think it, it took a long time for, it took a bit of time for some of the states to make progress. Um, however, I think during this pandemic, it's it's sped up the process now. Um, but when they take action, it was important for each state to look at um, it, additional investments in technology and what they were doing to um, expand on their infrastructure and what processes were needed to establish um, that data collection happens. And so uh, every state we spoke with had technology as a part of their infrastructure. Missouri actually developed its own software for case management. Idaho at the time that we visited had, um, was implementing Odyssey. And so that was taking up a great portion of the time for um, their case management procedures so that they could collect data on, on future cases and, and get better landscape data. Um, so the, the, do I turn it back to you, Brittany? I'm sorry. Yep, that sounds great. All right, so yeah, I would say um, Brick has hit upon a key theme of the, the efforts over the last few years in terms of the time that reform takes. And I think that will come up here in our discussion that um, we had to finish up that report because we were at the end of our time frame for that three-year implementation plan and our funding with SJI. And so not every state was totally through that process. Um, and understandably so in the sense that we were really asking them to take up this vision across 13 recommendations and the entire civil justice process and to reform it um, um, across the whole piece. Um, and one of the recommendations or one of the acknowledgements, I think, in the, the report that came out from this case study, which was released uh, just this spring, was that reform takes time, that it is a process and that these steps take time, engagement of stakeholders takes time. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit because, you know, that was, uh, an effort that started in 2013, the recommendations came out in 2016, and uh, we're still there with uh, reform in place and, and reform being active today. And so I think that's the question now that we are in this pandemic is where do we find ourselves today in this process of civil justice reform, these efforts that have been going on for so many years and facing these great challenges that we do in our court system to ensure continued delivery of justice in our court system where are we with civil justice reform? What are those key steps and takeaways? And what can we learn from the process of the last few years? And how can we 
um, address it here in light of the pandemic. So I think that sets us up really well for our discussion now to kind of turn it over to um, loop in David here into our discussion. And I'm gonna ask him now, how do we achieve successful reform? Is all of this work still ref relevant? What does the process look like? And what are the lessons learned as applied to this current moment? It's a huge list of questions and topics for us to talk about today, but maybe David, you could start with your experiences in Texas specifically in terms of what you've done and your thoughts now in light of uh, all the work that you have done now in the pandemic in your courts. Thanks, Brittany. Thanks, Brooke. Um, hello, everyone. It's good to be with you, uh, even if it's uh, remote. Wish we could all be together, but it's good to be uh, able to still connect with all of my uh, friends at NACOM. Um, you know, civil justice reform is something that um, many of us have been working on and watching over the last uh, several years. Um, and as uh, Brittany and Brooke have pointed out, uh, here in Texas, we uh, jumped head, head first into the um, idea of civil justice reform really several years ago with some reforms in the area of um, you know, basically how to triage cases in a way that we could deal uh, with them uh, separately, the ones that are, where there are different issues going on. So sort of uh, looking at um, how to expedite um, cases where they, there could be exp expedition occurring um, and, and providing the appropriate judicial resources on those. So that, that reform had really um, started, but there were a lot of other areas where we felt like we could do more. And so we began to um, look at how we could, uh, wh what our issues were, as um, Brooke has pointed out, we, we really did jump on that roadmap. Um, you know, Chief Justice Hecht here in Texas um, established a committee of the Judicial Council, which is our policymaking body uh, in, the, in the Texas judicial branch, and charged them with really looking at the civil justice uh, reforms, the, the civil justice initiative that the Conference of Chief Justices had put out, uh, the roadmap, um, and really begin to think about if that was the appropriate uh, way for us to go. And our committee quickly uh, really found the roadmap to be really helpful in guiding us through this process. And so our committee did do a landscape. We looked at uh, Texas's data, um, as Brooke pointed out, um, we didn't have data in every area, but we were able to uh, look at the data we have, compare it to the national data and see so many um, similarities that even where we didn't have data, you know, we basically co-opted the national data and said, well, why is Texas doesn't appear to be different in any other area? So why would we think Texas would be different in these areas? And so we were able to sort of take all that data to look at what is the situation uh, in our state with regard to uh, civil justice. I just want to give you a little bit of the information that we found in that landscape. Um, and uh, several years ago, just similar to the national data, We'd found that um, you know there been there was a lot of diversity in the civil docket in our state, um, but that had changed. Um, and in fact, uh, over eighty percent of our docket um, is now either contract or small claims cases. Um, so everyone's when they think of civil, think of the big medical malpractice cases, big contract cases. Uh, when in fact, a lot of our cases are really uh, the the smaller uh, amounts in controversy, smaller contracts or small claims. Um, we also found that um, a significant number of our cases were not going to trial. Um, they weren't even resulting in a, an, an agreed judgment or some other court um, a judgment after some trial of some sense. Um, in fact, most of them were either being dismissed or a significant number of them were being resolved through default judgments, which caused our committee some concern. So we, we looked at that data. There were lot, lots more data, um, lots of self-represented litigants in our system. And our committee then began to develop that, the vision and the goals around what is it that we wanted to do. Um, and so we, we began that process. Um, then the committee was, uh, basically took a look at that um, and came up with 16 um, broad recommendations. Each one of those had sub recommendations in them. Uh, so there were a significant number of recommendations uh, to do that. Um, and as Brittany just pointed out a second ago, um, I would say we're still on the roadmap. Um, not all of those recommendations have been implemented, as several of them have been, <clears throat> and, but we're continuing to, to work on that. Even um, you know, during the pandemic, we actually had a pilot project that was supposed to begin this year with some business courts. And as you might imagine, um, 
uh, there was an, another uh, thing that took, uh, took our attention. So uh, that uh, currently is on hold, but we're continuing in the process of, of trying to implement these recommendations. So Brittany asked the question about um, how does this apply during the pandemic? Um, and I think it's, there are a couple of really important things that all of us as court administrators uh, and, and judicial leaders should think about, which is that um, now is the time um, probably maybe as, as important as ever. Um, we know that um, there are going to likely be backlogs in our system um, in various areas, whether it's the criminal side of the docket, which is not the focus of our area today, or the civil side, we know there are going to be some, uh, some backlogs. And if we, um, one, um, the court doesn't take control of those uh, dockets, then it's likely that we're going to not see resolution of those backlogs in a timely manner. Um, and second of all, uh, if we uh, treat every case exactly the same with the same resources and don't do any triaging, um, just put the assembly line together and put the cases um, on the very back of that and see how long it takes us to get to them. Um, so I think it's really important for us to really think about the principles of civil justice reform right now, perhaps most more important now than ever before, uh, that we look at that uh, as well. Um, I think the other thing, and we can talk about this a little bit more um, with Brittany and Brooke, but the pandemic, I think, has proven to us that we can do reform. <laughs> um, you know, Brittany's talking about a three-year, four-year process. Um, many of us saw probably some of the biggest reform we've ever seen in a period of about a month uh, in the courts. Um, I know in our own state, um, there are things that we did have done during the pandemic um, that in a normal situation could have taken years and years and years, maybe decades, um, and they were done in a matter of weeks. So I think the pandemic gives us an opportunity to really step back, uh, look at the situation, um, know, evaluate what situation we have going right now with the, the caseload and the backlog, uh, and then really to take action to try to address that. So I think the pandemic is um, is provides us an opportunity. It's a huge challenge, but it's a big opportunity for us to really think about this. And, you know, maybe civil justice reform was kind of on the back of your mind before and you weren't thinking about it. I would just urge all of us to really think about that um, now perhaps is one of the most important times for us to really think about what's in the civil justice initiative report Let's look at the roadmap to think about how we can use those principles to really um, help us as we transition uh, back uh, to back out of the pandemic uh, over the next several months. Um, so I think I think this is a, a great time for us to really dig in and look at this. And so I think this presentation is really timely and I'm grateful for um, the National Center and IELTS for their work and their continued focus on this and bring it to our attention. Thank you. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, and I, I just will pause in, in our plans just to say, I really appreciate the, the partnership with Texas. And I think, um, you know, we partnered with four states in this roadmap effort. And I think, I hope that through that effort, we provided support along the way. And I also think because of that partnership, we learned a lot about that process and a, a lot of insights into um, what works and what doesn't. And so, I'll just throw out a plug that we are still here. We're still working on civil justice reform, despite that the three-year implementation plan uh, is over. Uh, and that particular phase of this effort uh, has come to completion. The National Center for State Courts and IELTS is continuing in this effort to work with states and to provide support. And we're always here if you want to call or email. And, and I will share more at the very end. But I just want to add that in this moment that um, this effort continues and our, our resources and support and um, efforts continue as well. So I think I'll turn it over, Brooke, to you for an additional question. Yeah, and I, I, I guess, David, what I was going to ask you, Texas is at the forefront of using Zoom for um, hearings, and I was very impressed by the way that you got all of those judges on Zoom um, and were able to train them and in remote hearings. And you all just had your first trial, your criminal trial via Zoom. And so I was just um, wondering about, is, is the remote trials and the remote hearings, are they here to stay? Do you think, or um, do you think that uh, 
I hate to say post pandemic because we're still in this pandemic and I think we are going to be for a long time. But do you think that that once um, jury trials can resume in person, that remote hearings will go away? So I think that's a great question. And I think it's really uh, it's when you put this in the context of civil justice reform, um, you know, as as Brittany pointed out, um, you know, technology was a major recommendation of the civil justice initiative. How do you use technology to really move forward the principles of civil justice reform? And, um, you know, as you point out, Brooke, here in our state, we have uh, jumped uh, headfirst into using technology to assist us. And Interestingly enough, um, you know, we've been watching the statistics um, in civil cases in our state. Um, judges are using, um, you know, in all cases, but in civil cases for, for today's presentation, judges are using technology um, to have ev- to do everything, to do um, initial reviews, um, to do status uh, conferences, to do scheduling conferences, to do trials, to do evidentiary hearings, whatever it may be, they're using the technology to do that. And what we've seen um, by the data is that the judges are actually, um, their clearance rate is above 100% in the midst of the pandemic, which was shocking to me, to be honest, because they're able to move these cases. Um, But the other thing, we're seeing some really interesting things that I'm not sure we uh, expected. Um, You know, judges are able to really do a good job of triaging these cases to try to figure out which ones really need the attention. Um, Court staff were able to interact with the attorneys and litigants to kind of figure out, you know, what are we going to need? How much time do we need? So that's been really, um, really great. Perhaps some of the most um, exciting things I think that we're seeing with the use of technology is just the efficiency that can be gained. Um, I mean, if you think about it for a second, um, in our normal court processes before the pandemic, um, maybe we'd have a, a, a case that would need a 15-minute hearing at the end or a 15-minute status conference. Well, everyone has to travel to the courthouse. Um, parties have to take off of work, have to find child care, have to find parking, have to travel to the courthouse, whether that's through driving or public transportation. Um, attorneys have to um, stop their law practice to come down to the courthouse for that. So they can't be working on other cases. They're only working on this one case. Um, And then um, it's likely that for that 15 minute hearing, they're probably on a docket where there are a number of other cases. So they're maybe sitting there for two or three hours, four hours, maybe even longer, waiting for their 15 minutes um, and before the judge. So it's, you know, a lot of inefficiency built into that system. Um, and so what we've seen happen is that, of course, uh, through the use of, of uh, technology and the waiting room, everyone can be going about their lives. Um, they can be, attorneys can be working on other cases, self-represented litigants can be at home or at work dealing with the situation. And then when it's time for their hearing, they pop into the, the Zoom uh, uh, courtroom, as we're calling it, um, have their 15-minute hearing, and then go about their business. Um, and so, you know, we've seen a lot of really positive things come from that. One of the, one of the main things um, I think that's been really interesting, and, and I know we've seen it in our state, and I know I've heard reports from all over the country that this is also the same, is um, more people engaging in their court hearings. Um, so whether it's on a small claims case or a child support enforcement case or eviction cases, whatever the, you know, the high volume dockets where I know the Civil Justice Initiative uh, you know, really said we ought to place a great deal of emphasis on how to manage these cases. Um, we've seen um, more uh, parties appearing for those. Um, I mentioned to you the high default rate before. It'll be really interesting to watch this default rate, um, you know, as we continue and have been doing remote hearings because um, I've not heard a judge that I've spoken to that handles one of those dockets that hasn't said that they haven't been having more people appear in fact, so much so they've had to modify their docket um, uh, priorities because, you know, they can't handle as many cases as they used to handle it in that docket because more people are engaging. And I think all of us in the justice system would look at that and say that's a really positive outcome um, that's come out of the pandemic. So I think, you know, Brooke, to your question of uh, is this here to stay, um, I, you know, I've been telling everyone the answer is a yes, <laughs> of course, it's here to stay. Um, now, well, 
Well, everything, you know, right now in our state, um, the Supreme Court is required that every hearing must be done remotely. Um, and, and judges have to use all reasonable efforts to do it remotely. Um, they can have in-person hearings, but only if they can't do it remotely. So pretty much everything is still occurring, uh, or almost everything is still occurring remotely. Um, so I think when, as we <clears throat> come out the other side of the pandemic, we'll see some more return to what was the pre-pandemic normal, um, where some, some hearings will still be held in person, because I think we know there are some hearings where that might be uh, a preferable way of doing it. But I think we've seen so much positive uh, advantages to the to the technology that I think we'll start we'll see um, a lot of it still remain remote. I mean, I know judges have that was number one question I received from judges. Uh, the repetitive question is, uh, are you going to take away our Zoom licenses once this is over? Because they they really want to continue doing it. Of course, my answer has been no, um, because you know we really want to see them continue to use it. So. I think, you know, again, we'll have to find that balance, um, figure out exactly where the, the right balance is. And I would just point out one more thing um, that's right in the roadmap, which is, I think, really important. And I keep stressing to, uh, to our folks here, as well as um, my colleagues around the country, is the, the last step of the roadmap is evaluate. Um, and it's easy to look at it from the court administrator side right now and say, oh, wow, this part's awesome and this part's not so great. And, and we have our own preconceived notions of what's working and what's not working. And the fact is, we don't really know <laughs> until we really collect the data and evaluate. So I think a key piece of this will be to, to do the evaluation to make sure we know what impact um, all the changes we're making are having, um, and then make adjustments as needed. I mean, I think the roadmap as you as as the Civil Justice Initiative um, uh, put it out is a circle. <laughs> it's a continuous circle. Uh, where you're really looking at all the things you put in place, you're evaluating them, you're putting back together your stakeholders, uh, and you're going forward from that. So I, I think we'll have to evaluate the impact of technology, um, how it's benefited, maybe where its shortcomings have been, and then make adjustments as necessary. But definitely, I think that it has a, a, a huge uh, uh, role in our system going forward. And I think you make a fantastic point, David, that there are a lot of people that are participating now in cases, whereas before they weren't, and that the courts need to um, manage those cases. So um, the roadmap was put together pre-pandemic. Do you think it still is a valuable tool? And if so, is there any kind of tweaks or changes that need to be made to it now? That's a great question. Um, and as you were going through the roadmap, I was actually kind of uh, uh, linking it up to some of the changes we've made during the pandemic. Um, and what I would say is I would absolutely endorse the roadmap as a great model for really any type of reform, um, but in particular civil justice reform. Um, you know, if you think about it, you've got to have someone who's leading. You've got to have engagement of stakeholders. You've got to have a vision and goals. You've got to develop action plans. You've got to just implement those. Then you have to evaluate. So all those things are still in place. And the one thing that I would say is um, uh, I may be unique to the pandemic and to our experience during the pandemic is we've proven that that whole roadmap process doesn't have to take four years. Um, you know, even during our civil justice reform road um, that we've taken so far, it sometimes takes a long time. Um, and that's just the way I think we have typically operated. And I think the one thing that the pandemic has shown us is um, maybe it's not necessary to take that long. Um, we have a tendency, I think, in the courts to want to plan, 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 make sure everything's perfect, make sure everybody's on board, get it exactly perfect and then maybe we'll finally implement it and that process just takes a long time and I, I think one of the things that we've learned is that you know obviously we don't want to make mistakes and we don't want to make huge mistakes but sometimes you just have to move um sometimes i, I said you know the, the nike sl uh, slogan has been really important during this pandemic just do it uh you just have to go um and you know uh evaluate it and then make adjustments as you need to Keep your stakeholders engaged to where they can provide feedback to you about what's working and what maybe where there needs to be adjustments. But um, I think, you know, we've shown that we can make uh, changes uh, during during the pandemic. The other thing I would say is and I don't think the roadmap doesn't apply to this, but I think the way we've sometimes uh, adopted it um, has been how this is how we've done it is 
the roadmap doesn't say you have to have everything done all at once before you can implement. Um, I think what we've seen during the pandemic that's worked really well is incremental change. Um, you know, maybe maybe you make a tweak here um, or you implement this uh, civil justice reform now um, and, and maybe sort of just do a little bit of a time or there may be even big changes, but just do a little bit of a time um, rather than trying to feel like you have to solve the whole problem before you can begin implementing. And I think that's, you know, again, I don't think the roadmap says that you have to wait, but I think, you know, at least in our state, we sort of thought, well, let's solve the whole thing, get our whole list of recommendations together before we can start implementing. And I think one thing that I've taken away during the pandemic is, um, you know, let's make the changes we need to make when we need to make them, um, even if they're small and incremental. Uh, but again, that roadmap is still important. Um, you still get the engagement of the stakeholders, get their feedback. Um, you still evaluate, you still come up with plans, you still implement them. So I, I think I think the roadmap still um, applies today uh, as much as it did before. Maybe the maybe the the spin on that roadmap is going, maybe the, the spin's a little faster um, than what it was before. Uh, and I think that's something that we all as courts can take away is we really do um, have to, we can't wait forever to make these changes. We, we have to move. Um, and to me, that's the biggest message uh, for really anything, but civil justice reform, other types of reform in the judiciary is, but we can't, we, we just have to, we just have to just do it. Um, we have to just get going on this because, um, you know, as, as the civil justice minister pointed out, litigants aren't gonna wait for us forever to make these changes. Um, they're gonna go find another place to take care of their business. Um, and so we can, as, as Chief Justice Balmer said in his uh, quote that uh, Brittany showed at the very beginning, we can either be the, the leaders in that change or that change is going to happen to us. And, and as Chief Justice Palmer points out, if we're not the, leader of the change, leaders of the change, we won't have control over the outcomes. Uh, but if we actually take, and take the leadership and jump in and start making these reforms ourselves, themselves, we can then have a better um, sense of where it's going and I think ultimately have better outcomes even for the litigants in our court system. I'm going to pick up on a, a few of those things that you mentioned along the way. I, I think it's such a good point that you talk about it looking like a pick up the whole system, figure out all those changes, work through the process with a committee, and then finally get to action. Um, I think that's it's a it's a natural takeaway from the roadmap in its structure as well as historical reform efforts in our courts. I think that's the traditional way courts have approached it. And um, in some ways, I think, and we, we actually debated this a little bit in, in doing the final case study and the report is, do you create kind of a, an action circle instead of those clear, you know, a line of steps? Um, and, and recognizing to your point, it's continuous improvement. So it is a circle and it's kind of a revolving wheel instead of this clear line and path where you take up the whole system at once. And, that's one uh, takeaway from Missouri's efforts that we had in the report and that I thought stood out as, as a committee as they were working through the recommendations where they, where at least one of their committees, if not both, saw something that was kind of a low hanging fruit or something that could be done quickly. They just moved that up to the Supreme Court as they were working and kind of said, hey, let's address this as we go, let's not wait two years, and they just moved things out of their effort um, into action along the way, and I think that's a, a great point and probably particularly uh, relevant to today and having to move quickly and, and that um, admonishment of just do it, don't wait. Um, the other thing that I'm curious about your thoughts, David, is the involvement of stakeholders, I, I anticipate that that is a really challenging thing in this moment where courts have got to move quickly. They have to be responsive to the challenges of the pandemic. And so I'd love your thoughts on, on that piece of involvement of stakeholders and how do we do that in this moment? Is it still important? Um, I've heard a few places in the country where there have been challenges of pushback. And so I'm curious, how do you move in this moment? How do you just do it? What are the challenges if you don't get input, but also how do you get input when you're trying to move quickly? Because that I think is the piece that takes the most time in this plan. Yeah, I think that uh, I think that's a, a big challenge. It's challenging generally. It's a challenge now. It'll be a challenge in the future. And I think it 
in my mind, it might, might look a little bit differently than it did before uh, pre-pandemic. Um, you know, one of the things I think that we're finding too is, um, you know, there are a lot of people in our system, internal and external stakeholders, who just like it the way it's always been. Um, I always say that perhaps maybe because the courts rely on precedent so much um, that we're, we're sort of always looking backwards. <laughs> And so it makes it hard for us to look forward towards innovation because, you know, we've done it that way for hundreds of years. It's worked fine. So why wouldn't we just keep it that way? Why do we need to make these changes? Um, and so there's sometimes, I think, resistance to change because of that. So I think, you know, uh, Chief Justice Hecht and I just wrote an article for the National Center for State Courts Trends publication that just came out. It talks a little bit about leadership during a crisis. And one of the things that we, we talk about there is, you know, you obviously want to listen to the stakeholders. Um, it doesn't mean that they have to be um, in control. Um, and so, you know, the, the roadmap points out, consult with stakeholders. Um, I think a lot of times we've thought about, well, that means we have to get unanimity or agreement before we can do things. And, you know, I think sometimes the courts need to look again at what is, what is the, what are the vision? What are the goals? What are we trying to do here? Um, and it may be that you have to implement change over the objections of your stakeholders. Um, I mean, I know, quite frankly, if we would have asked the the bar up front in Texas, do you want to do thing? Do you want to have virtual uh, appearances? Um, I don't think the answer would have been yes. Um, but you know, we did it, and then what we've done since then is we have surveyed the bar. We we have a stakeholder group that we put together quickly to try to gain feedback from them about what was working, what maybe we need to adjust. So it's not like we excluded them completely. We just knew we had to do it. So we just did it. Um, and then we tried to engage the stakeholders to try to make sure that um, we were uh, you know, addressing all of their concerns. Um, and so we've got, you know, we've got, a, we've got a criminal group. We've got a civil group or a family group. We've got a, a justice court group, which is our small claims and high volume docket group. We sort of put together these various groups to kind of hear back from them where we might need to make adjustments. But um, I think maybe the, the one change I would say is... Um, Sometimes I think you have to, the stakeholders can, in a sense, sometimes get in the way of change that you know that you have to do. Um, and the other thing I would say is um, we've oftentimes looked at, our, <clears throat> looked at our stakeholders as the bar or judges or clerks or court administrators or someone sort of, you know, internal to the process. And I think, you know, oftentimes we forget about who our real stakeholders are, which are the users of the court system. I think if we would have surveyed, um, and if, if, if when we talk to and survey our users of the court system, um, which are the external, true external stakeholders, um, they would absolutely endorse virtual appearances. For example, um, you know they really appreciate the fact they can do that. So you know, again, you've got to think about who your stakeholders are. I think you have to just, just sometimes. Again, I'll just go keep going back to it. Sometimes you just have to do it. Um, you know, unless there's a major reason why you can't, um, I think you have to. And, and, you know, Brooke asked me about virtual trials earlier. This is a perfect example of how to go about doing this, where basically, you know, we, you know, we did actually survey the bar about this. And, you know, about 57% of them said, never, no way, we can't possibly do virtual trials. We did it anyway. We're doing virtual trials anyway. Uh, we've got attorneys. We 43, I told someone um, yesterday, you know, 43% said yes. So, um, you know, let's take those 43%. Let's, let's work with them. Let's try it out. Um, and so, you know, I think once we start, you know, working through that, I think just the fear of the unknown oftentimes is a barrier to change um, and reform. And so we, we really did work with them to try to get, uh, you know, agreement upon that. But, you know, then we just do it and then we learn from it. And then once everybody else starts saying, hey, that's not so bad, it's working okay, then we have better uh, agreement. So, Again, stakeholders are important. I, I don't want to send the message that we shouldn't be um, engaging with them, but the key is to make sure that you, you don't let that be the barrier to doing change that is really needed and necessary, and then you get the, the feedback from them and make adjustments as you need to um, after that. Wonderful. Um, so maybe in our last few minutes here, um, I'd love each of your thoughts on kind of your takeaways from the roadmap and experience. And so Brooke, maybe a, a, just a minute or two of your takeaways and any key recommendations you would share 
Well, first of all, I think David hit the nail on the head of saying um, stakeholders are to be consulted, which is correct in the roadmap. And I think it equally applies here, especially during the pandemic. And um, the, the, I think Maine was another good example of that, even pre-pandemic when um, the um, committee in Maine was um, smaller, of course, because it is a, it is population-wise, I think it's the smallest state, um, one of the smallest states out of the four. And so they did consult the attorneys um, and went back and created a, an attorney stakeholder working group. But I think you're correct, David, that you, I think attorneys are always going to push back and look look back um, because that's the way the court system is used to doing it. It's it's precedent. Um, and so um, what we what I learned is is that there are going to be strong opinions about court changes and and but you just have to do it anyway. And I think clear communication from the courts, um, what we've seen from Texas and what we've seen from, from quite frankly, all the courts around the country is that clear communication is just key um, to engage with the court users um, and the different stakeholders. And I think people are, um, the court users are um, the end user people who go to the court system are are really willing to use that technology and engage um, if there's clear communication with the court. And so now the other thing that I noticed is that prioritization um, and clear timelines for change, um, they, they can be staged. So you're right, David, everything doesn't have to happen at once. Um, you can take the uh, quote unquote, low hanging fruit and uh, take care of that right away. Um, and then study and research it and see what works and what doesn't. I, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, and it, it just requires momentum and to keep that momentum going forward. So um, I think the report that uh, Brittany and I and Isles um, published in April of this year, um, right during the pandemic, provides guidance based on that experience of the four states who successfully done this. And they've done it pre-pandemic. And I think it's just as important, if not more important now, to build off what we know and um, to manage that change and to know that it's possible. David, what do you think? Brittany, I know we just have a minute, so I just want to take, say one thing to my NACOM friends here, which is I know I know a lot of the listeners today are probably um, local court administrators, um, and so you're looking at a state court and you're thinking, well, how do I do this? And let me just say from a state court administrator perspective, some of the best um, advances during the pandemic and even before the pandemic have come from local courts being innovative and doing things, and it helps us at the at the state level learn from how, how to basically take something to a broader audience. So what I would say is, I think all of you as local court administrators really need to look at the roadmap, look at the civil justice initiative uh, recommendations, and maybe begin to experiment some with, it, with that so that we at the state level can learn from you and other states can learn from us. So um, that's just my last key message there to my NACOM friends. Wonderful. That's perfect. And I think that that ties right into uh, my closing and my key uh, recommendations is that that all of these efforts have really um, been spurred by that local innovation, the courts that have kind of moved the ball forward. We took all of that and learned from it in the CJI recommendations. And that is kind of what builds the basis for the national recommendations. But I agree, local innovation, piloting things, if it doesn't feel like you can do this statewide, that you don't have to do it all at once. And then finally, that I think it has been um, shown to me at least, and I hope it is true across the country, that as I look back, these recommendations I think still hold true. I really encourage states to still pick them up. I think they'll be really valuable as we face a, a rising caseload here coming uh, through the pandemic and out of the pandemic. 
And I think um, turning to our last slide here, I highlight that we have a large number of tools and resources that have come out of this three-year effort. And I encourage you to go to our website and just thank you all for listening to this um, program and thank you to the panelists.